Welcome back to This Week in Immigration. I'm Rachel Yakano. On this week's episode, we discuss everything from President Biden's fiscal year 2022 budget request to the vice president's recent trip to Guatemala and Mexico, for which we'll be joined by special guest Eric Olson of the Seattle International Foundation. More of that to come, so stick around. On May 28th, President Biden released his proposed budget for fiscal year 2022, requesting $6 trillion in total mandatory and discretionary spending for the upcoming fiscal year. The full request follows the administration's outline of its request for $1.5 trillion in discretionary funding in April, representing an 8.4% increase over regular discretionary spending in fiscal year 2021 which importantly excludes any emergency spending on COVID-19 relief. Appropriators in Congress have already held hearings with cabinet officials to review the discretionary proposal and will soon start to work on fiscal year 2022 spending bills, which must be enacted by September 30th, 2021. The new spending proposed under the budget request largely reflects the major proposals already outlined under the administration's $2.3 trillion American Jobs Plan and the $1.8 trillion American Families Plan, which would overhaul the nation's infrastructure and invest in education and social safety net improvements, respectively. But what is in the president's budget that would impact federal departments and agencies who oversee immigration? With us today to unpack this looming question is this week regular Teresa Cardinal-Brown. All right, so let's start with the basics. Immigration policy is handled by a myriad of different federal agencies and departments. When you're looking at the budget, what agencies do you look at first and why? So it's easy to say you start with the Department of Homeland Security because the three major immigration agencies of the federal government are part of the Department of Homeland Security, and that's U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, and Customs and Border Protection. But there are at least three other cabinet departments that have a toe in the immigration waters. So one that maybe people didn't know about but now are very familiar with is the Department of Health and Human Services, the Office of Refugee Resettlement, which has always had responsibility for resettling refugees, but also has the authority for dealing with unaccompanied minors who are apprehended at the borders. They now have a much more, I think, well-known part to play in the immigration in dealing with migration in the United States and, and dealing with immigrants. Also, there's the Department of Justice. And again, the immigration courts are a significant part of the Department of Justice. But also, as longtime listeners of This Week in Immigration will know from our series on the gavel, the Department of Justice is also responsible for defending the federal government in federal lawsuits over immigration policy. That job falls to an office called the Office of Immigration Litigation in the Civil uh, Litigation Act branch of the Department of Justice, and they've been very busy lately, too. Uh, The State Department has a significant role. Obviously, they run all the embassies and consulates overseas that issue visas to people who want to come to the United States, and they oversee the overseas refugee program for the United States. And then last but not least, the Department of Labor. They have a role in making sure that people who are being sponsored for temporary or permanent visas to work in the United States are not doing so at the expense of U.S. workers, either in taking a job that would otherwise go to an American or working for wages that would undercut American workers. So all of these cabinet departments have money that, if put together, would make up the immigration budget of the United States. And I'd say that's a pretty significant chunk. (laughs) So with with all of these different agencies and departments in mind, um, you know, what are some of the major adjustments or alterations in the budget requests that you've that you've noticed that you want to highlight? So I think there are a few trends that I would see across all of these agencies that are worth noting uh, that the president clearly is trying to address. One is addressing backlogs. There's additional money given to the State Department, to Department of Justice, to USCIS to address backlogs in applications. 
During the t- pandemic year, the State Department's consular offices have been mostly shut down. And so there's a huge backlog of people who are eligible to get visas, green cards, as well as temporary visas, who have been waiting to apply at consulates and haven't been able to do so. So there's a huge backlog there that's going to have to be addressed as consulates start opening up. In addition, we know that the president wants to significantly increase refugee resettlement to the United States in the next year. 125,000 refugee admissions is their goal for the next fiscal year. So there's a huge plus up for all of the agencies, Health and Human Services, USCIS, and State Department that deal with refugee resettlement and admissions. A few other things that are very notable, obviously we know that President Biden discontinued construction of the border wall. So in looking at the budget for Customs and Border Protection, for example, we see that they're gonna send back to the treasury, if you will, uh, several billion dollars that they're not gonna use for building the wall. However, they're also asking for more money for other things like building and refurbishing uh, ports of entry along the border. Uh, There is funding for a new central processing facility for CBP to process additional migrants coming in. And then there's other things that I noticed that do indicate some somewhat different directions of policy. For example, there's money in the Department of Justice to fund more legal representation for certain immigrants and immigration proceedings, uh, particularly people who are unaccompanied children or people in vulnerable positions. So that's a definite policy shift, I would say, from the prior administration. So when you look at a budget request, budgets, as uh, our colleague Bill Hoagland is happy to say, are always policy documents. We can see some indications of changes in policy the administration might make. A couple of things that it doesn't look like they're going to change very much. Uh, Immigration and Customs Enforcement is still going to be funded for about 30,000 detention beds and 2,500 family detention beds. That's only slightly lower than the previous administrations have had, and that would not indicate, for example, a wholesale defunding of ICE or even a defunding of the ICE detention apparatus. And many immigration advocates are very disappointed to see that. There's a significant increase in alternatives to detention, but uh, not a lot of detail what those programs might mean. So I I think overall, when you look at the various budget uh, line items across the government, You do see support for some of the big things that the president has been talking about. And in other places, it's a little bit of the same old, same old. So I I touched a little bit on this in my intro, but the the president is requesting a significant increase in spending from the last fiscal year, you know, in general. So, So given this increase, do you foresee any challenges in getting Congress to pass these budgets specifically for those agencies that oversee immigration policies? What's interesting about this is there's not a unified immigration budget. As I mentioned, there are five different cabinet departments, all of which happen to have, they they all come under separate appropriations bills. So when Congress is working, they pass about a dozen different bills that fund the federal government. Each bill funds either a cabinet department or a couple of cabinet departments and other agencies. And that process... um, In normal times, the House would pass a dozen appropriations bills, the Senate would pass a dozen appropriations bills, they'd conference those bills, and you'd have 12 laws that the president would sign. I don't think anybody alive remembers the last time it happened that way. Uh, In the last many, many years, most of the time, all of these bills get rolled up into one big bill that's called an omnibus bill. Or maybe you have a couple of bills that combine several of them together in so-called minibuses. And I think that that's likely to happen this year as well. What makes it even more complicated is that the process to get to those appropriation bills includes Congress passing its own budget. This is the president's budget. This is what he wants Congress to do. Congress then passes its own budget that says, this is how we are gonna give the administration money. And it's that process that sometimes involves something called reconciliation that the administration and many Democrats want to use to support not only funding these immigration priorities, but also maybe other things like the infrastructure package or the American jobs plan or even immigration reform. 
And that makes that process a lot more politically fraught. So I would say the chances of these bills passing separately is close to none. How much of this will make it into the final bills that Congress passes at the end of the day? I think we're not going to know until later in 2021 uh, at the earliest. Thanks, Teresa. I think that's the perfect place to leave it. Lots of interweaving processes that we will continue to monitor and talk about here on the podcast. Absolutely. Up next, Vice President Kamala Harris traveled to Guatemala and Mexico last week on her first international trip as vice president where she spoke with the country's leaders in an effort to address the root causes of the increase in migration and warning the thousands of people fleeing the region against journeying to the United States. Harris has been subsequently criticized by progressives for her speech in which she bluntly told migrants not to come to the United States, while simultaneously is being criticized by Republicans for not visiting the U.S.-Mexico border as she works to stem the sharp influx in migrants arriving there. To help us unpack the prospects of addressing the root causes of migration from Central America is special guest Eric Olson of the Seattle International Foundation. Teresa, I'll turn things over to you to introduce Eric. Thanks, Rachel. So for this portion of the episode, we are joined by Eric Olson of the Seattle International Foundation. Uh, Eric is a member of the SIF interim leadership team. He is director of policy and strategic initiatives for SIF. His primary responsibility is to oversee the foundation's engagement with the policy community in the DC area, including folks like us at the Bipartisan Policy Center. Eric has uh, consulted with us and worked with us in the development of our recommendations on how to manage migration in Central America, although he has no ownership for those. I will, I will disclaim him from that. But he's got over 30 years of living and working in Latin America and policy experience in Venezuela, Honduras, Mexico. And so he is the perfect person to help guide us through these issues. So Eric, welcome very much to This Week in Immigration. Thanks, Teresa. Very glad to be with you. We've talked a little bit in the last few episodes about Vice President Harris's role that she's been sort of assigned by the president in dealing with the root causes of migration uh, in the region. Let's first talk about that root causes question, right? It comes up a lot. We hear it in the news, um, but it's really talking about the situation on the ground that that is what's causing migrants to decide they have to leave. We're seeing, and we have seen now for eight years, a lot of migration coming from the Central American Northern Triangle, the countries of El Salvador, Honduras, Guatemala. Talk to us a little bit about what you see as the root causes of migration from that region. What is the sort of fundamental driving force that's, that's, that, that's causing this right now? Well, as, uh, as people have conducted uh, surveys amongst uh, migrants, both those who are thinking about going and those who have already left and maybe in the U.S. or in shelters along the way, uh, the reasons people give generally break down into three broad areas. One is prosperity or lack of prosperity, poverty, uh, can't survive, can't uh, feed their families, so they're more economic in, in nature. The second one is, uh, broadly speaking, a security question, a question of uh, gangs, uh, violence in the neighborhood, uh, you know, uh, murder, assassination. Uh, a lot of times uh, also interfamily violence, violence against women, uh, just a feeling of you know un- lack of safety for oneself and for one's children is a big part of it. Uh, and the third one has to do with a broader general sense of lack of good governance. The government services are not there, are not available. Uh, people can't rely on governments to provide health care, to provide uh, a quality education, to make sure the roads function, to make sure there's water and electricity. And so there's a, a failure of governance generally that, that also makes life uh, difficult. Uh, and uh, the high levels of corruption that exist really makes them feel hopeless about it. And I, I think that I wanted to just add that last element, that hopelessness element that people express over and over again, the sense of they don't have a future in their country. They don't see a future for themselves 
or they don't see a future for their children. And they're deeply concerned about that. And so that generalized sense of, uh, of hopelessness, what the academics call subjective well-being, is a driver of migration as well. Obviously related to all these other things, but a broader sense of hopelessness can be a driver as well. So I remember very clearly in one of our earlier meetings, when we were discussing these issues. You talked about that last point and you said it's sort of like the the last thing on top of the pile, right? That there's all of these other issues that you just talked about, you know, economic security, personal safety, corruption, governance. But that last piece that at some point they just feel like it's never going to get better. And the only thing I can do is leave. That's that's sort of the last thing on the pile. And I like that image because it seems to me that we try to put migrants in these boxes. Oh, you're an economic migrant or you're an asylum seeker and you have protection issues or, you know, it's a it's a failed state that's driving government. But, you know, it's it's any combination or all of the above. Right. Exactly. I think in some ways uh, we can give uh, the wrong impression that these things divide out neatly. Right. That it's economic or security. Well, as, as a matter of fact, in many poor communities, people eke out a living selling tortillas, selling toilet paper, selling eggs, but they are being extorted by the gangs, sometimes by local police. Uh, and so there's an element of security and there's an element of lack, uh, lack of economic opportunity for them. Uh, that combine that are, are 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 you know not easily separated, and so that's what gives this uh, this sense of hopelessness such power. Let me just give you one quick story. I was with a group of researchers on the border between Mexico and Guatemala, visiting different shelters, and we went into one in Tabasco in Tenochtitlan, and I was talking to a Honduran woman. And I was asking her, why did she come and what, what, you know, what was going on with her? And uh, I said, you know, I just I really don't totally understand what's why you're taking this enormous risk, because it was clearly very risky. And she said, when I watch TV and I see the reports that my president is engaged in corruption and my government is a corrupt one, I know that they don't care about me. They have no interest in my needs or meeting my needs. And so we see no future. I don't see a future for my children. And I think that was just a very clear articulation of this, that when there's that much corruption, when there's that failure of the government uh, across the board in every aspect, uh, people do feel hopeless and they don't see any anybody that cares about them going to take care of their needs and, and they give up. Or... They're vulnerable to people telling them, hey, there's an easy solution. Go to the United States. Work there. People are welcoming you there. All those things that we know aren't necessarily true either. Yeah. So this leads really well into the vice president's trip to Guatemala and Mexico this past week. You know, she explicitly said messages we've heard from the Biden administration and the Trump administration before them and the Obama administration from that before them about don't come. It's dangerous. It's risky. You're risking your life to come and you may not get in, you know, based on your your experiences and, and people like that woman you met. Are those messages effective in any way? Do they have any impact at all? Probably not very much. I think people are well aware uh, of the risks and dangers on that route. They come prepared. I'll tell you, I ran into some people on the border of the United States and Mexico, two kind of older gentlemen, and I said, how did you get here this far? And, uh, uh, they said, well, we, we walked and hitchhiked. And I said, well, you know, where did you stay? And they said, we came with no money because we knew we would be robbed. And we figured as long as we had no money with us, no one was going to mess with us. So I think people uh, have over time learned from other migrants. They know the risks. They know what's at stake, but they're feeling desperate and they're willing to take the risk of, of making that journey. So I understand why the vice president does it. I understand why politicians in the U.S. do it. We don't want them to have a false sense of hope. 
But at the end of the day, I'm not sure that's what's going to make a difference for people and their decisions to migrate. They're migrating for other reasons. So so let's go back to those reasons, those root causes we were just talking about. I mean, that's really what the vice president was in the region to do, to try to see what can the United States do to address those root causes. We know that she secured some investment commitments from some companies in the United States to invest in uh, the countries down there. Uh, there's a lot of conversation about development, economic development, working with civil society. What do you think are the primary things that the United States could do uh, in the short or medium or long term to really address those root causes? Well, I think all the things that you mentioned are really important, and I'm glad she did that and and, and announced that those things she announced and an initiative with young girls and women, uh, support for small and medium ent- entrepreneurs. I, I don't. I don't think those things are are wrong, or I, I think they're very valuable. Uh, but at the same time, I think um, they're not really gonna. Uh, you know, you know, really crack the nut here. Really make the difference uh, for the region, and that's. Uh, because, you know, as we look at countries like Guatemala, they're countries that are highly unequal, unequal and in, in economically, racially, every which way. Uh, there's a very few uh, elites that control the vast majority of the wealth in the country and high, high numbers of, of poor people who have poor, low education rates and poor economic rate and and very low uh, uh, health rate, uh, access to health care. Sorry. Um, and so, you know, as long as that situation exists, when the tables are uneven or the field is uneven and and people uh, have control, a few people have a control of of the economy, of government and can guarantee their own interests at the expense of others. I think it's pretty hard to envision uh, things changing in places like Guatemala. Uh, there being broader educational, healthcare, and economic opportunities. So that's why we've emphasized the issue of governance, uh, creating rule of law, fighting corruption. These are all the things that tilt the scales to benefit a few at the expense of many. Uh, this is where well, there was a hearing this morning that I testified on on judicial independence in Central America. It sounds like a highly technical issue that shouldn't matter to much of us, but it's actually through a corrupt uh, a court system, an attorney general, a justice system that the elite in the country guarantee their impunity and guarantee uh, their control of society and the economy and preserve the underlying imbalances and racism that exist in a country like Guatemala. So I think uh, the vice president and certainly the State Department are recognizing that until these issues of, of, of corruption and control of the court systems uh, are dealt with, all what we all of what we do will be helpful in part, but won't really uh, uh, transform these societies in the long run. That's why the vice president talked over and over again about protecting uh, uh, the special prosecutor against corruption, protecting judges, ensuring that the justice system is independent of political n- manipulation. Uh, that's at the core of this argument. I mean, I think you you made the point, and I, I think it's worth us talking about that a little more. I mean, these are all, you know, really high level, very detailed uh, issues of of governance and uh, d- democratic institutions and, and policies that have been tried before. I mean, we've been working at this a long time. What do you think is new or different, or should be new or different about what this administration is trying to do, or do you think it's about kind of getting back in the game a little bit? Well, I think there's a couple of different things. In the past, we've dealt with governance and corruption in in a very sort of technical way. We've we've approached it as what they need is new laws. What they need is more training. Uh, and, And those elements are, of course, important but really don't address the underlying and uh, 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 corruption that is uh, controlling institutions of government. 
people get trained and they go back into a corrupt system, a corrupt government, and their training doesn't really help them at, at the end of the day. So I think what we've said is that this is not just a, cor- a problem of a couple uh, rotten apples that you've got to throw out, but this is a problem of the barrel. And so we need to look at broader and deeper reform uh, of greater accountability, of creating the incentives to be uh, um, more transparent. Uh, all of these are the things that, that you know, the corrupt uh, uh, authorities in these governments want to protect. They want to get rid of transparency. They want to get rid of the independent press, independent uh, civil society, and any independent uh, uh, justices. And, and, and unless you uh, address those underlying issues of uh, systemic corruption, uh, you're kind of working around the edges. I have to say that during the Obama administration in particular, there were some important advances with support for the UN mechanism to fight corruption in Guatemala and the OAS mechanism in Honduras. Things began to change. There were real accountability for presidents, former presidents, ministers, members of Congress in a way that had never existed before, but we lost uh, we lost interest in that in the United States, and the focus went to stopping migration and the corruption and, and rule of law agenda kind of fell off the scene. And so I think, yes, it's redefining it, but also recapturing some of what we were doing in the past. The second half of her trip was in Mexico, and you know Mexico is you know traditionally the number one immigrant sending country in the United States, but no more. Now they are a transit company and they also are receiving asylum applicants in, in Mexico. So they're in a somewhat different position than they have been a long time. The vice president talked with Mexican leadership about those issues of development and dealing. What, what role do you think Mexico can play, maybe different than the United States, in addressing these issues in Central America? Well, I I think that uh, Mexico has a huge role it can play. Unfortunately, and as you know very well, Teresa, you know, Mexico has traditionally seen itself as, like you say, a pass through, you know, you come in the back door and you go out the front door into the United States and the quicker you do it, the better for Mexico. I think things have changed now and they've recognized that they they are a recipient country. They have to be able to provide people an opportunity for protection and asylum, uh, but that they also can help address the drivers of migration themselves. It's not just something the United States has has to look at, but also Mexico should do it. Uh, And that was part of what they tried to accomplish on this visit uh, between uh, Vice President Harris and, and President Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador to sign a memorandum of understanding, to work together to address some of these drivers of migration in Central America may seem like a small thing from our perspective in the U.S., but it really is a first step for Mexico uh, to begin to think about uh, its role and responsibility in Central America. The vice president's been criticized uh, by both sides of the aisle for some of the comments that she's made about this trip. You know, she talked about uh, the message to the migrants to not come was not received well by progressive immigration advocates. And, uh, you know, Republicans are saying, well, she hasn't been to the border at all. I, I, how do you see, you know, just sort of from your standpoint, the the upshot of this trip? Do you think it was, it, it met the expectations that maybe the administration had? Do you think maybe the political winds around it are asking too much or too little uh, of this trip? What's your What's your sort of grade on the outcome here so far? Well, I have to say, I think she did better than 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 many of us expected in Central America uh, and, and, you know, to some extent in Mexico. I understand that there's a very sort of U.S. centric political analysis of what what was accomplished and and that she may have been graded down lower uh, on that front. Frankly, I, I think that uh, 
in some ways, it's a little bit of a diversion for what is really at stake here in Central America. Uh, if we want to have a more stable, prosperous region in Central America, we have to focus on those issues over the long haul. And so I'm less concerned about whether she goes to the border or not. Uh, those are more, I think, in my mind about scoring political points in the U.S. I think her job in Guatemala was to be clear, to be frank with them, and she did a good job on that. Did she fix all the problems? No, of course not. You don't do it in a 24-hour trip, but you do set a tone. You do begin to lay down some of the markers that hopefully will lead us in a good direction in the long haul. I'll tell you one thing that, that I, I was a bit disappointed in was this statement, not so much about stay home, don't come. I, I get why they say that, why they do that. But this sort of this promise that everybody will be returned, that, that's a little worrisome to me. I do think uh, that the U.S. has an obligation and, in fact, is living up to it in many regards to allow people to seek protection if they deserve it, you know. And uh, to just say you're all going to be returned in mass, I think, is a uh, is mistake. I don't know that she meant it necessarily in that way, but that's the way it came across. And so... I think we do have an obligation to be sensitive to the needs of protection for Central Americans and Mexicans for that matter. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, that's one of those things that we, in the U.S. debate about the border and migration is very, happens a lot like, oh, the president is inviting people to come and it's our border policies that are the reason we're seeing so many people arriving. You know, you've talked a lot about the push factors how how much of a big deal is it what the U.S. policy is? I mean, she said most of you will be sent back. The numbers show right now many are not being sent back. Uh, you know, maybe about half are, but not all of them for sure. How, how do you think that impacts the migrations that we're seeing right now? Well, I think people overwhelmingly are leaving Central America for these factors that we've mentioned. Uh, I'm not saying it's all of the, it doesn't explain everything. I think, um, as you know, family reunification is also a big issue. Uh, labor demand in the United States is an issue. But I think, you know, the context right now in Central America is one of COVID, of the inability and, you know, lack of preparedness for by all the countries to respond adequately to COVID, uh, two massive hurricanes. And I think there's just, you know, on top of all the other issues we've talked about, that there's just a real pent up sense of despair and frustration and people are coming uh, regardless of what happens. So I do think, as the administration has outlined, I'm sure as you've spoken, there are things that could be done to improve border management, migration management in the region, in Mexico for sure, and obviously along the border. I think the administration is making some effort in that regard. Whether it's adequate or not, I'm not enough of an expert to be able to say. But I do think that we can't lose sight of addressing the issues in Central America, or else we're bound to repeat this, you know, every four, five, six years. So let's wrap up by just saying, what do you think the next steps for the administration should be? Notably, she didn't visit Honduras or El Salvador on this trip, the two other countries that are major migrant sending countries right now. What do you think the next steps should be? Well, I think I think the administration is trying to focus energies in Guatemala as an effort to show uh, that progress can be made. And I think, you know, there were a number of messages and commitments made in Guatemala. So it's now a matter of following up and insisting that that the government of Guatemala carry through and focusing on uh, um, fighting the corruption and, you know, governance and 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 economic policies that have been identified. I think it's going to be a little more difficult f to figure out how to engage with El Salvador, where you have a r rising uh, autocrat uh, who is kind of running roughshod over the institutions of government and has been attacking civil society. Uh, there's some real issues in Honduras. They're in an electoral process. And so there's probably some wisdom to waiting to see how that pans itself out. Uh, so, you know, 
I, I wish that we're playing fully in all three countries, but I understand there's reasons not to. And, and I think that uh, Guatemala will be the test case and it will require a pretty decisive uh, and focused effort on the part of everybody in the administration, not just the vice president. Well, Eric, thank you very, very much for joining us. I hope that uh, as these things proceed, you may join us again to give us the benefit of your expertise. But thank you so much for joining us on This Week in Immigration. It was my pleasure. Glad to do it. And I'm glad to come back anytime. That's it for today's show. Before we go, a quick reminder to subscribe, rate, and review this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, or your favorite podcast platform, and share it with your friends and colleagues. You can also find more information on all of the issues we discuss here on the show at bipartisanpolicy.org slash immigration. You can follow us on Twitter at BPC underscore bipartisan. I'm Rachel Yakano. This Week in Immigration was created by Teresa Cardinal-Brown. The executive producer of This Week in Immigration is Teresa Cardinal-Brown. This week's episode was written by Teresa Cardinal-Brown and myself. Yafet Tawahada and Ethan Plotkin produce and edit our show. See you next time on This Week in Immigration. Mm-hmm.